Welcome everyone to the American Cornerstone Institute's Cornerstone Conversation on the Sanctity of Life. My name is Evelyn Lim. I am the Director of Policy and Research at the American Cornerstone Institute. Today, we are so fortunate to welcome our excellent panel on the Sanctity of Life. But first, I wanted to do a little housekeeping item. So the audience, welcome for, thank you for joining us. You can ask um, questions through the Q&A function. Feel free to ask at any time. Uh, we will answer your questions, hopefully throughout the event or towards the end of our conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our esteemed guests. We have Robert P. George, who holds the McCormick Professorship of Jurisprudence and is the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He served as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the President's Council on Bioethics. So he was a judicial fellow at the U.S. Supreme Court where he received the Justice Thomas C. Clark Award. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate, a sophomore, he holds the degrees of JD and Master of Theological Studies from Harvard University. He also holds uh, the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, Bachelor of Civil Law, Doctor of Civil Law, and the uh, Doctor of Letters from Oxford University, in addition to two, 22 honorary doctorates. He is the recipient of the U.S. Presidential Citizen Medal and Princeton University's President Award for Distinguished Teaching. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to introduce, of course, Dr. Ben Carson, who is our world-renowned neurosurgeon. He became the youngest chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Children's Center and served for 29 years. He is an emeritus professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and holds more than 60 honorary doctorate degrees. In 2001, he was named by CNN and Time Magazine as one of the nation's 20 foremost physicians and scientists. That same year, he was selected by the Library of Congress as one of the 89 living legends on their 200th anniversary. He is the author of several best-selling books, a Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient, the 17th Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and the founder and chairman of the American Cornerstone Institute. So welcome to you both. I want to thank you for joining us on this very timely and important topic. I want to turn it over to Dr. Carson for some opening remarks. Well, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Professor George, or Robbie, as I know him. I've known him for many, many years. Uh, one of the most brilliant uh, minds in the United States of America. And uh, I know your time is very valuable. And we really appreciate you being here. We're looking forward to your insights. You know, this is such an incredibly important topic, you know, life. You know, our founding document talks about life as a gift from God, a right from God, uh, not a right from government. And yet we find ourselves in a situation where we're having intense arguments about whether life should be taken or not. Or in fact, when does life begin? Interestingly enough, we've learned a lot about life since Roe v. Wade. Over these last 50 plus years, we have been able to actually visualize that forming individual. Just a mere six weeks after conception, we're already seeing a heartbeat. In many cases, as early as three and a half weeks after conception, we see that. We have a neuropod, a brain that is starting to develop very, very rapidly, uh, 400 million new neurons in one day. That's how fast it can develop. And it's very interesting to me that you have all of these people who are up in arms because there may be a development going on that might harm the environment and hence the lifespan of a snail darter. That baby is a lot more sophisticated than a snail darter. So why are we not concerned about that life and more concerned about the snail darter? And I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about the snail darter. I'm just pointing out the difference in that case. 
But what we have to recognize is what is happening with conception? You have the male gamut and you have the female gamut and they join together to form a zygote, which now has the full complement of chromosomes. And it becomes an individual at that point. It's, it's not part of the mother. It's not part of the father. It is an individual at that point in time um, that already has programmed into it the genetic information, which allows it to mature into an adult of our species. Now, what I find most disturbing is that people don't want to acknowledge the personhood of what is in the mother's womb, what is in the most protected place it can be in. And if you've ever seen an abortion, it is the most gruesome thing imaginable. How could we do that? I mean, you can see the actual suction probe being introduced into the uterus on the ultrasound. And in some cases, you see the baby move away from it. He's trying to get away from it before it sucks one of his arms off or one of his legs and tears his head off. I mean, it is the most barbaric thing imaginable. And yet we do it and act like, eh, nothing to it. And that it's the right of the woman to kill that baby because that baby resides in the safest place in the universe where it can be. It doesn't give you a right to kill it. You know, I'll say a little more about that a little bit later on, but I wanna hear Professor George. Well, Ben, first let me say uh, what an honor it is uh, to be with you for this uh, podcast. Um, you as, uh, as you said, you and I have been friends for a very, very long time. Uh, but despite being friends, uh, you are truly one of my uh, heroes. You have devoted your entire life and devoted the gifts that God has given you, the wonderful intellectual skills and the incredible dexterity to the preserving of life, to the restoring of health. Uh, you pioneered certain forms of surgery. Uh, you did things that people would have thought and did think were impossible to save lives. Uh, separating conjoined twins that other people would have thought it impossible to uh, separate and doing so many other things. And of course, you've served our country with such great uh, distinction. And uh, like uh, so many of our fellow citizens, I'm really grateful uh, for that. And congratulations uh, on the founding of the uh, Cornerstone uh, Institute. Uh, and thank you, Evelyn, uh, for that kind introduction that you uh, provided and for your work at uh, Cornerstone. Well, Ben, one of the things that has bound us together, not only as friends, but as colleagues, for example, on the President's Council on Bioethics, where we served mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, has been our shared commitment to the sanctity of human life in all stages and conditions. Behind that is our commitment to a very special, very deep, foundational, I would say, principle. And that is the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. Our dignity, our rights are not, as you rightly say, gifts from government. They are rather, as our Declaration of Independence puts it, uh, things with which we are endowed by our creator. We hold these truths to be self-evident. The second sentence of the Declaration says that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are, very first, life, liberty, and the pursuit of, of happiness. Now we ask ourselves, where did that principle come from, the profound inherent and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family? After all, not all cultures, not all civilizations, not all polities have recognized such a principle. We ourselves have so often dishonored it as we did with slavery, with segregation, as we are doing today with abortion, we have dishonored it. And yet still at least, in our civilization, in our polity, we proclaim it 
we have at our best tried to live up to it. So where does it come from? Well, it seems to me, Ben, that the reason that we have embraced it is that it is an implication of the teaching of the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. And that is where we are taught that human beings, though mere dust of the earth, are nevertheless fashioned in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is. That gives the human being a very special status. And that leads me then to ask myself, so in what respect then are we human beings godlike, irrespective of race, sex, ethnicity, wealth, power, status, condition of dependency, stage of development? What is it about us human beings that is godlike? It, it can't be our physical makeup or appearance. It can't be that, well, God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose. It can't be that. So what is it? It seems to me what it has to be is that like God, although in a much more limited way, but this is our God likeness. God's infinite, we're finite. God's unlimited, we're limited. Still, we have a little piece of something in us godlike, and that is the qualities, the powers, the attributes of reason and freedom. Unlike brute animals, God has made us creatures who can deliberate, inquire, judge, decide, act freely, and therefore can be held responsible. It's our nature to exercise reason and freedom. Uh, a lioness doesn't uh, deliberate and make a moral judgment about whether to take down a gazelle for dinner. <laughs> uh, that's a matter of instinct and impulse not deliberation, judgment, and choice. Lionesses and lions are not godlike. But we human beings are. We can inquire. We can ask, should I own a slave? Is it right to, to segregate people by race? Is it morally just to take the life of an unborn child or a frail, cognitively disabled, elderly person suffering from a dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or something like that. Is it right? We can ask and answer those questions precisely because in our very limited way, but nevertheless, really, we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are bearers of reason and freedom and therefore bearers of inherent worth and dignity. And that is our nature. And from the very earliest embryonic stage, we are, as you rightly put it, Ben, putting it in scientific terms, programmed, mm -hmm. genetically and epigenetically programmed to develop those powers of reason and freedom. We don't exercise them as embryos. We don't exercise them as fetuses. We don't exercise them as infants. We don't exercise them until well into childhood. And yet, even as infants, even as unborn children, we are developing ourselves by an internally directed process to the position where we can, in fact, exercise those capacities. So if we ask ourselves, who is this guy? Let's just take an example, Dr. Ben Carson. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? What's his story? What's his biography? Well, we might look at uh, the, the adult Ben Carson the, I don't know, Ben, let me take a guess, 39-year-old Ben Carson. <laughs> and we ask, okay, now is he the same Ben Carson who at 24 was a medical student and at 18 was a college student and at 14 was starting out in high school and at 11 was in middle school and at three was a precocious little kid running around causing trouble and at one was... A little infant and before birth was a fetus and before that an embryo yes it's the very same person it's not that some some embryo later became the being that is ben carson by some mysterious process where something that is one thing becomes something else you're the very same whole living member of the human species the same individual who developed from the earliest embryonic stage, what you rightly 
uh, labeled the zygote stage, from the earliest embryonic stage into and through the fetal, infant, child, and adolescent stages, and ultimately into adulthood with his determinateness, unity, identity, fully intact. So that's why we not only can say, we must say, there's no rational alternative to saying that I or you, Ben, is the very same person, the very same human being, this very same member of the species Homo sapiens, who was a college student, a high school student, a child, an infant, a fetus, an embryo. You were never one of those gametes whose union created the embryo, the new human being, those gametes are, gametes are both functionally and genetically parts of other human beings, mom and dad. But once the embryo is formed, the genetic information, the genetic material uh, uh, that's been contributed by the gametes becomes part of the composition of a new human being. The gametes cease to exist. They're no longer there. You were never a sperm cell. You were never an ovum. And yet you were an embryo, every bit as much as you were a fetus, an infant, a child, an adolescent, and now, of course, an adult. Well, you know, Robbie, I don't think I've ever heard it put quite that way. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty dramatic, I must say. And it does give you pause. And I, I would like a lot of the people who are pro-choice to hear that. You know, I have to tell you that at one point I was pro-choice. And uh, I didn't believe in abortion, but I said, I don't have any right to tell anybody else what they should do. And, uh, you know, I firmly believe that. And then I was thinking about the whole concept of slavery. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the slave owners, they felt that they owned the slave and that they could do anything they wanted to them, including kill them. But it was the abolitionists who felt not only that it was wrong for them to do, but that it was wrong. It was societally wrong. And they made it their business to stop an evil practice. Now, what if they had taken my initial attitude and just said, well, I don't like slavery, but you know, if, if, if it's okay for you, you do whatever you want. Uh, maybe we have a moral obligation to do what's right. And, uh, you know, as it says in the book of Proverbs, you know, the 24th chapter, you know, if you see someone being drawn to death, uh, can you just turn your back and say, I, I, I didn't know about it? Or do you have some responsibility to do something? And uh, this, is, this is where I've become motivated to get involved in the pro-life movement and think about those babies we can save. We talk about the barbarians of ancient societies and how they sacrificed human beings. Are we any better? You know, we've killed in this country beyond 60 million human beings. It's unbelievable. And yet we think that we're morally righteous. How can that be? The sheer magnitude of the carnage obscures for us the depth of the evil. We, we can't look it in the face because of its sheer magnitude. We avert our gaze. We we turn away. We, we don't want to actually confront the reality of 60 million plus. And yet, we must look at the facts straight on. We must face up and do something about it. You know, Ben, I um, read a wonderful book by the late um, historian William Lee Miller called Arguing About Slavery. Mm -hmm. And I was struck in reading the book, in which he does not mention the abortion issue at all, of course, it was not an issue in the period in which he about which he was writing. But I was struck at how the allegations that are today made against pro life people are exactly the allegations, the charges, the uh, claims made against the abolitionists. The pro slavery people said, they're busy bodies interfering in other people's business. They don't respect a constitutional right. Of course, slavery was a constitutional right protected, according to the Supreme Court, in the Dred Scott 
decision by uh, the, by the Constitution itself. I think that was a poor reading of the Constitution in the same way that Roe versus Wade is a dreadful reading of the Constitution. But they would say there's this Supreme Court decision that protects uh, protects slavery, and these people don't respect constitutional rights. These anti-slavery people, they would accuse the anti-slavery people of being religious fanatics who are trying to impose their morality on other people. And it's also interesting, Ben, that they came up with all sorts of justifications. They said, for example, you know what? If we didn't have slavery, if there wasn't a slave trade, if we didn't purchase these slaves, they would all be killed in terrible tribal wars in Africa. Those slaves would not have been allowed to live when they were captured by an opposing tribe. They just would have been murdered. That's what happens when they're not sold into slavery. So the slaves are actually better off. Does that sound familiar to you? Isn't that the kind of argument that you hear today Absolutely. justifying abortion? It's like there's nothing new when well, we- there's no, there's no justification, um, but am I happy that I was born in the United States rather than some other part of the world? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if my ancestors were brought here involuntarily, you know, Joseph in the Bible was brought to Egypt involuntarily, but uh, he took advantage of gifts that God had given him and ended up as the second person in charge of Egypt. Um, so was I'm it a good remember, thing that man. he went there? I don't know if it was a good thing or not, but he made good out of it. I, I, if I recall the, the story of Joseph and his brothers uh, uh, from the Bible correctly, when he finally reveals himself to his brothers, when they come to try to find food during the famine, when he finally reveals who he is to them, am I right, Ben? Does he say, what you meant for evil, God used for good? Isn't yes. that what he, what he said? I think I remember that. That's exactly right. And, and, and that's sometimes we have to look at the big picture yeah. uh, rather than get bogged down in the details. You know, right now, there's so much strife in our country uh, because we don't look at the big picture. Uh, we look at our own little ideological point uh, and don't really consider how it affects other people or how it affects the society at large. And as a result of that, you know, we become entrenched in the way that we think with, with no give and take. And that can be problematic uh, also. I think, um, I think back to a, a conference that I was in in South Africa and uh, the Academy of Achievement Conference. And one of the people there was the head of the ACLU. And he was giving a talk about how the ACLU speaks for those who cannot speak for themselves, uh -huh. for those who are helpless in our society. And he went on making it seem like they were just such wonderful, wonderful individuals. Uh, so uh, in the Q&A session, I stood up and I, I said, you know, there was a, a woman who came to see me. She was 33 weeks pregnant. She was on her way to Kansas to get an abortion because that was the only place they would do it. 33 weeks, that baby is viable outside of the womb without support. And uh, they had asked her if she would see me before she got the abortion because the child was found to have a neurological issue. Uh, I convinced her not to go through with the abortion. So she had the baby. I did have to do an operation. But the baby's fine and she loves that baby and she's so glad that the baby was not aborted. But I asked him, would you speak for that baby? I said, that baby had no voice, no possibility of getting their side of the story out. Would you speak for that baby who was perfectly viable outside of the womb and was in the safest place in the universe that it could be? And he hemmed and he hawed and he ducked and he dodged, but he would not answer the question. So he was unfortunate enough that evening to be sitting next to me at dinner. And I said, let me make this easy for you. <laughs> I said, um, you know, I operate on little babies that are 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. 
several weeks more premature than this baby that we talk about was. Uh, and those babies are in the incubator, they're on maximum support. Will you speak for that baby? Oh yeah, absolutely, no, no, no problem. I said, but the one who's much further advanced and the safest place they can be, you can't speak for that one. And he said, well, I realize it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> he says, but I believe the woman has a right to kill that baby until the second it is born. And I said, would you say that in public? And he said, no. But today they will say it in public. Yes, of course. They will Those even say it after the baby's been born. This is where we've migrated to. And you may remember Bill Clinton said, you know, abortion should be rare. Um, now they're asking for abortion on demand. It's a that slippery slope argument. You know, Ben, it um, used to be uh, that uh, people would argue that abortion should be permissible because we don't know when life begins. Uh, that was not credible in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was handed down, and it is certainly not credible today. And yet you still hear people saying that the president of the United States says silly things like that. Uh, in fact, we know perfectly well the basic facts of human embryogenesis and embryological development. There are no mysteries and you don't need to be uh, a brain surgeon. You don't need to be a medical doctor. You don't need to be a, uh, an anatomist. Uh, all you need to do is, is have Google and a computer right. and you can get the basic facts of human embryological development. Um, as a matter of fact, although there was a time, obviously, when there were great mysteries about human embryogenesis and early development, uh, it, was a, it was a subject that was, was rife with speculation. So, for example, in, in the ancient Greek world, you find Aristotle advancing speculative theories of how life begins. In the medieval period, you find uh, writers, uh, Christian and Muslim writers, for example, who are speculating in various ways about when life begins. But in the 1820s, something that you're very familiar with, of course, uh, happened, and that is von Baird discovered the mammalian ovum. Mm -hmm. And that inaugurated modern human embryology. And very quickly made clear that all the past speculation was no longer of any use or interest at all because we now understand human embryogenesis and human embryological development as a continuous gapless project uh, process uh, one that is as you said internally directed so from the zygote stage from the one cell stage the new organism is just that a new organism a new complete not a part of something else not a part of a mother not not some, some part of a father a new complete human individual which by directing its own integral organic functioning will in fact develop itself unless prevented by violence or disease from the embryonic stage to the next stage which we call the fetal stage to the next stage, which we call the infant stage, to the next stage, and so forth, and ultimately into adulthood. Those stages are just that. They are stages of development. The terms fetus and, and embryo or infant or adolescent are not names of different things. They are names of the same thing at different developmental mm -hmm. stages. Now, this is no mystery. Yeah. You know, no matter what the New York Times says, no matter what Joe Biden says, no matter what Nancy Pelosi says, look it up. Mm -hmm. No one has to be in abject ignorance about these matters. It is not some great mystery. And it's not a theological question. It's not a question of when an immaterial soul enters the body or something like that. It's a straightforward question of science. Well, some people have, yeah, some people have tried to be very pragmatic. And they've said, well, I think it becomes a viable life at the point that it can survive outside of the womb. Uh, now, as you know, 50 years ago, that was a very different number than it is now. <laughs> yes, that's a sliding <laughs> scale. That's right. And Technology keeps pushing it. 
who knows what it'll be 50 years from, from now. Um, ben, ben, how uh, how viable is a, I don't know, healthy, otherwise healthy 21 year old adult on his own without food or other material um, in Antarctica? Not very viable at all. <laughs> Not viable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think his rights vary because of that? Or, or how about one of your patients who was on a life support system, not viable without the assistance of others, not viable without mechanical equipment? Did, or, did or his right it, to life disappear when he became unviable? Or, or is it at a time when you've reached maturation? Um, is that the time that you become viable? Because if it is, then human beings don't reach full maturation of their brain until their mid to late twenties. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm told that it's uh, the boys who develop later than the girls. I don't know if this is true, but I, this apparently accounts for uh, boys being a little slower. Uh, getting into more trouble and and and, and being <laughs> more risk takers. You know uh, that the that the female uh, uh, brain is complete in its circuitry and formation a few years ahead of the male. Is is that actually right, Ben? Those studies were all done by women. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, it is true. Women do develop a little bit faster. They mature a little faster uh, than males do yeah. for some strange reason. There's probably a good reason for that. I don't know what it is. We'll have to ask the Lord one day. Yeah. But, you know, the, the whole concept of rights for women. Uh, you know, that's the big driver of this. Why should a person have the right to kill something because they can? Because you have power over something, does that give you the right to terminate its life? And I think that's a question that you'll find uh, many of the people who advocate for abortion have very difficult time answering. Yes, indeed. I mean, one of the things that people need to be aware of is that it is not a good idea to defend a view of rights or a view of a particular putative right that intrinsically undermines the very idea of a right. And that, I think, is what uh, people who call themselves pro-choice have backed themselves into. If there are, in fact, human rights, which everybody these days claims they believe in, right? This seems to be the main currency of moral discourse. Everybody says, I'm a believer in human rights. I stand up for human rights. Well, what are human rights? Human rights are rights we have simply in virtue of our humanity, not in virtue of our good looks, our strength, our intelligence, not in virtue of our social status, not in virtue of our um, uh, ability to perform this or that role or function, just in virtue of our humanity. But if that's what human rights are, then all you need to possess fundamental human rights is to be a human being. And then that immediately shifts us back to the basic scientific question, all right, at what point do we have a new human being? And here again, don't take my word for it. Look it up in any standard text of human embryology and developmental biology. Go onto the internet, <laughs> look for any treatment, any serious scientific treatment of human embryogenesis and embryological development, and you'll have the answer. It's from the very beginning. It's the story that, uh, that, that Dr. Carson told at the very beginning about the formation of the, of the zygote. So the question really, Ben, that we, I think, need to put to anybody who makes a claim of a right to kill, whether it's to kill the frail elderly, to kill hostages, to kill prisoners, to kill in a cause they believe in, to, uh, to kill unborn babies, the question we need to put is, well, okay, if you believe in such a right, haven't you undermined the whole idea of rights? You must think that rights are not something we have simply in virtue of our humanity, in which case then you can make no credible claim of a right for anything. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting and deep thought. Now, 
you know, there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of weeks about the uh, Texas heartbeat bill. And uh, there are those who think that this will lead to the uh, de facto overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, I'd be very interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I uh, have predicted publicly uh, without allowing myself any face-saving devices, if it turns out that I'm wrong, uh, I predicted publicly that Roe versus Wade will be overturned. Uh, I believe it will be overturned, no, though not in litigation uh, concerning the Texas law. Uh, the Supreme Court has made clear that it's not going to intervene uh, in that case, which uh, presents very uh, complicated procedural uh, issues. I think, Ben, that Roe versus Wade will be overturned in the case coming up out of Mississippi called the Dobbs case, uh, yeah. in which uh, we have a Mississippi law that prohibits elective abortion, uh, that is abortion that's not uh, medically for the purpose of uh, uh, saving the life or preserving uh, the health of the mother. Um, uh, it's a Mississippi law pro prohibiting pro uh, elective abortions after uh, 15 weeks. That decision is very clearly in conflict with Roe versus Wade because Roe versus Wade says that at a minimum there has to be legal abortion up until viability. And while the technology has pushed viability back from where it was in 1973 at the time of Roe versus Wade, which I believe is about 24, 25 weeks, to 23, maybe 22 uh, weeks. It's certainly not back to 15 weeks yet. We may get there, but it's not there yet, which means you've got a law that's squarely in conflict with Roe versus Wade. Now, what does the Supreme Court do about that? A majority of justices seem to have signaled that they're going to uphold the Mississippi law. But I don't see any way to do that without overturning Roe versus Wade. And I've been reinforced in this view uh, by the work of my former student, Sharif Girgis, who's now a, a professor at uh, Notre Dame Law School, uh, who in uh, a piece that um, uh, was published originally uh, on a blog called The Bullock Conspiracy, has shown really quite rigorously that there's no way for the court to do what it seems to have signaled it is going to do, uphold the Mississippi legislation as constitutionally uh, legitimate without overturning Roe. So I'm expecting that there will be an overturning of Roe. I hope it'll be by 6-3. It may be by 5-4, uh, but I expect that it, that it will be uh, overturned. At that point, of course, the matter will be returned to the legislative uh, domain. Now, I myself, together with my um, former supervisor, uh, my doctoral supervisor at Oxford University, John Finnis, very eminent, uh, internationally renowned uh, scholar of jurisprudence. Professor Finnis and I have submitted an amicus curiae brief to the Supreme Court in the Dobbs case, saying that the court should do more than merely reverse Roe versus Wade, that the court uh, should uh, examine the question of whether the 14th Amendment itself protects unborn children against elective abortions um, under the due process and equal protection clauses, which protect the rights of persons. And we uh, provide uh, a mountain of evidence, I think it's fair to say, that uh, the framers and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment, which uh, was ratified in 1868 in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, understood persons to include the unborn. They were themselves living in the wake of von Baer's discovery of the mammalian ovum and the uh, launching of what we now know as uh, modern human embryology. Uh, they were aware uh, that uh, uh, unborn children were in fact human beings. And many of the legislatures that uh, enacted strengthened abortion laws to protect the unborn in that period were the legislatures that ratified the 14th Amendment. But even if, even if the court would do what we are asking it to do, I don't expect it will. I expect it will overturn Roe versus Wade, but not declare the unborn to be protected under the 14th Amendment. But even if it would do that, it would still leave considerable room for legislation, first in the state legislatures and then if necessary in the Congress, uh, because there are obviously uh, many cases uh, in which you have uh, the, uh, the, the question of whether uh, an abortion or the, an act that results, whether you call it an abortion or not, would not be material, but an act that results in fetal death is nevertheless warranted. Uh, for example, in a, in a classic sort of case that you'll be familiar with, uh, there's the case of the cancerous womb. Let's say a woman uh, is pregnant, 
uh, the baby has not yet reached viability, uh, but because of a fast growing cancer that threatens the life of the mother and child will die as well, uh, you have to remove the womb. That removal of the womb will be the proximate cause of the child's death, but is that to be permitted or not? Now, uh, pro-life people have always said that that's a case in which uh, the uh, fetal, fetal death is not the object of the act, it's not intended, uh, it's a foreseen but accepted side effect, and, and therefore it can be morally permissible and should be legally permissible. But those kinds of problematic cases where we, we do have a direct conflict of, of uh, our concern with the women for the life of the woman and health of the woman and fetal life, in that kind of case, your, your legislatures are going to have to act to design the law. The Supreme Court cannot simply design an abortion statute or a statute that's going to cover all cases in which medical procedures could result in the death of the uh, developing uh, child. Uh, but if Roe is reversed, the legislatures will at least have the opportunity to protect children against elective abortions and then decide under what circumstances certain sorts of medical procedures are necessary and therefore permissible. Yeah, the, when you were talking about uh, you know, removing a cancerous uterus, it, it reminded me of a case uh, some years ago in which uh, the chief of obstetrics, obstetrics and gynecology uh, from one of the hospitals in Baltimore came to me. And he says, I have this woman uh, and she's pregnant with twins. And one of them on ultrasound has been diagnosed with hydrocephalus, water on the brain. And that head is expanding so rapidly that it's gonna put her into premature labor and neither of them is old enough to survive outside the womb. Could you do an operation while the baby is still in the womb to alleviate the hydrocephalus? You know, it was still pretty early in my career, but I had already started developing a, a reputation. So that's why he wanted to know if I would do it. And, um, you know, obviously I was a little uh, put back. Uh, how, do, how do you do this? I did some research. I, I found out that there was a neurosurgeon in Philadelphia who'd been doing some experiments on sheep with hydrocephalus in utero and how to alleviate it. So I contacted him and said, do you think we could, uh, could very quickly get this uh, organized and do it in a person? But we couldn't do it at Hopkins uh, because you couldn't get an IRB, you couldn't get it through the committees, you know. Oh, no. You can't do that. But uh, at one of the community hospitals that didn't have, you know, an internal review board, <laughs> Or things like that, we, we were able to actually take this woman and place the shunt uh, while the baby was in utero, watch the head shrink under wow. the ultrasound and uh, preserve the uh, pregnancy for several more weeks until the lungs were mature enough to survive outside the womb. And uh, the day that they were born, it was a big national news story. My brother called me, hey, I just saw you on the national news. Um, and you know, it was, it was quite a thing, but then all the critics were saying, that was the, the wrong thing to do. You can't do that. There had actually been an article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks before that saying we weren't ready to do intrauterine surgery yet. Um, but a few weeks later, it became clear that not only was the normal the non-hydrocephalic baby okay, but the hydrocephalic baby was okay too. And then all the critics were saying, well, I would have done that too under those circumstances. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, several years later, we were at a banquet and uh, this uh, gorgeous statuous uh, young woman comes up to my wife and says, are you Dr. Carson's wife? And uh, she said, yes. And she said, your husband operated on me when I was still in my mother's womb. Oh my gosh. And now here she is fully grown, fully able to take care of herself. And that's why you'll never convince me that what's inside of a woman's uterus is a useless bunch of cells. 
<laughs> what an, ben, you're amazing. It's amazing what you know. You you have this incredible gift for doing these surgeries. You've been a pioneer in so many uh, of them. Uh, God bless you. That's just wonderful. And what a great story. Well, it is, it is God. Quite frankly, it's 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 not me. Uh, I let him use me. But well, God gives us our gifts, but it's up to us about how we use them. And exactly. you have used yours so beautifully in the cause of humanity to save lives, restore health. You know, it is very important that we understand that that uh, pregnancies can provide present genuine problems, terrible problems for women. No question about that. Pro-life people shouldn't uh, be accused of not taking that seriously. We do take that seriously. But our answer is that killing is not the answer. Right. Our answer is that we love them both. And we need to be serious about that. And we are serious about that. If you look at these wonderful clinics around the country, almost all staffed by women, I, I uh, try to do what I can uh, for them. Often I speak at, at banquets and so forth to raise money for the pro-life counseling centers and so forth. These, these women, ordinary people, often moms themselves with kids at home, doing this great work for their sisters, taking in women sometimes who've been abused, sometimes under pressure from boyfriends or fathers or, or, or parents to... To, to go through with abortions, but they don't want to do it. They realize that what they're carrying inside them is a precious human being. Um, this is really an important part of what we do. The media won't give us any credit for it. You know, we're criticized by the people on the so-called pro-choice side saying we don't care about women. We deeply care about women. We right. deeply care about all members of the human right. family. And we realize that our love and concern and aid need to be there for mother and child alike. What we will not do, what we refuse to do, what I will under no circumstances ever do is pit the good of the woman against the good of the child. Treat the mother and child as if they are enemies. They are not enemies. Of course. They are precious human beings bound in the most intimate of relationships. Love them both. And I, and I think we really uh, have to think hard about making sure that we compassionately let that mother know what her options are. A lot of times when they go to these clinics, you know, if they mention at all what the options are, uh, you know, they just breeze by it very, very quickly. And no one really talks about the trauma, the emotional trauma that these women suffer. Some mm -hmm. of them, it packs them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Some of them commit suicide. I mean, it is horrible what happens when you start mm -hmm. thinking about killing an innocent little baby. You know, another aspect of this, Ben, that we've got to mention, people don't like it, but we've got to tell the truth, is abortion is a big money industry. Absolutely. Follow the money. It's a big money industry. Huge. Why aren't women told about the beautiful option of adoption? When there are so many couples eager to have children when they themselves can't be the biological parents of, of children and not just, uh, you know, the, uh, the stereotypical, you know, uh, perfect kid. There are plenty of people who will take children, even children who have problems. Absolutely. And love them, them and give them great lives. Yeah. But, but instead, you know, instead people, women are pushed into abortion, into taking the life of the child. And as you point out, and then have to live with the consequences for that entire, for the rest of their lives. It's terrible. I knew a woman who had a, an organization and they specifically existed to take those children who were defective in some way and uh, to provide them with love and a home. And, you know, I had a chance to meet and get to know a lot of those children, just delightful, incredible individuals. And there are some people who would have denied them life. And uh, I just think we have to be very, very careful. But uh, another thing that is of interest is when you go back and you look at Planned Parenthood, uh, recognizing that the founder of that organization uh, believed in eugenics and uh, actually felt that, you know, Margaret Sanger was a hero in Nazi Germany. And uh, she felt that there were certain people in our society who 
perhaps were less desirable than others. And uh, maybe we could uh, cut down on the number of those individuals. So interestingly enough, Planned Parenthood clinics appear at a much greater frequency in, the, in those neighborhoods where they felt that they were undesirable individuals. So there, there is evil on top of evil. <laughs> there is indeed. And you, you see the legacy now in the terrible treatment of Down syndrome people and in the extermination of Down syndrome children in the womb. This is a horrific scandal. And we need to remind ourselves where this comes from. Eugenics, Ben, I, I don't know if all your, your, your listeners know this, so they need to know it. Eugenics was not invented by the Nazis. They picked up the ball and ran with it, but it was not the Nazis who originated it. People like Margaret Sanger were into it up to their ears. It was originally pioneered not by Nazi thugs, but by polite, sophisticated, urbane, educated, progressive people. People like Carl Binding and Alfred Hoka, the German legal scholar and medical person who wrote the book in the late 19 teens before the Nazis had even come onto the scene called uh, The Defense of Taking Life Unworthy of Life, Lebensunswertes Leben. They came up with the idea, these polite progressive people, these sophisticated, urbane, learned, educated people came up with the idea, some lives are so poor that they're not worthy to be lived. Now, the Nazis, as I say, took the ball and they ran with it. They made an industry out of it, but they didn't invent it. The progressive movement, Ben, was into eugenics, hook, line, and sinker. There's a wonderful book by my Princeton colleague, wonderful and frightening book, by my Princeton colleague, Thomas Leonard. He's known as Tim Leonard, precisely on this issue, on the question of how, on the, the history of how the progressive movement bought into eugenics and promoted it as hard as it could. Now, the progressives today don't want to know that. They don't want people to talk about that. They don't want that to be remembered. They want that to be forgotten, pushed under the rug. But we mustn't let them forget it, especially since that impulse, that eugenic ideology is alive today. And we see it in, for example, the abortion of what, 80% of children who are diagnosed in utero with Down syndrome. It is a scandal. And, you know, it, it would be good for people to actually meet some individuals with Down syndrome. Some of the most loving, <laughs> nice individuals that you can possibly meet. Uh, you know, there's a, a little girl at our church uh, who has Downs. Everybody just loves her and she, she loves everybody. Um, just because they have a neurological defect uh, doesn't mean that God doesn't value their life. And, uh, you know, if we get rid of everything that is imperfect, uh, pretty soon there won't be any of us left. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's hard, I think, for human beings to genuinely embrace and hold on to the concept of human equality. We, we talk a good line, especially we Americans. We're, we're willing to say the words, we believe in equality, we believe in equal dignity. But it's tough for human beings to hang on to it. But think of how radical and beautiful a concept it is that each and every member of the human family, no matter how weak, no matter how poor, no matter how so-called defective, every member of the human family is the bearer of equal dignity. That the Down syndrome child is every bit the equal and fundamental worth and dignity of Ben Carson, who's a person of extraordinary intellect and skill, of, of great basketball players like, you know, is it Michael Jordan? of great thinkers or, or scholars or scientists like Al Albert Einstein. And this is why we would rightly be appalled if someone said, let's take a heart from a living, uh, cognitively disabled child to save the life of a great physicist. We'd be shocked, we'd be scandalized. We wouldn't go for that, we wouldn't permit that. And yet that's exactly, that is what we commit ourselves to when we commit ourselves to the radical principle or the principle of radical human equality. 
And it's really the pride of our civilization. It's the best thing about our civilization. We don't always live up to it. We haven't always lived up to it. We've been struggling to overcome our own failings with slavery and segregation and eugenics and abortion and euthanasia, struggling to live up to it. But that principle is the best thing about us. And if we would only be more faithful to it, we would truly be a great people. Well, even, even today, in our woke society, we still don't value all human life. And I would just have you take note of Chicago every weekend. Uh, all the people who are murdered in Chicago and all the people who are shot every weekend, it's, it barely gets any attention. And yet if it were in certain other neighborhoods, it would be a major story. And, uh, and then we have the nerve to say that we think all lives matter. <laughs> I, yeah. I, wor I worry about our society when we are so hypocritical. Yes, that's, that's the least pretty aspect of our culture, the hypocrisy. What's best about us is really our principles. What's worst about us is our hypocrisy. And the way to overcome that hypocrisy is to finally be true to our principles. But I'm, uh, I'm actually encouraged. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know this too. The number of Americans who oppose abortion has been steadily increasing. And I think it's secondary to the fact that our technology yeah. is able to show us what's in the womb now to a much greater degree. And one of the reasons, if you go into Planned Parenthood or another abortion clinic, they never want the women to actually see an ultrasound. Yeah. They don't want you to actually see that baby. You know, it's, it's so endearing when you look at the, the, the ultrasound of a baby who's a, you know two months old or three months old, and you see that cute little nose, <laughs> and, and you see the little eyes and, and the little fingers and yeah. the toes. I mean, come on. How can you in any way say that that is not a human being? And the blood is circulating and it's starting to respond to the environment. It will move. I mean, if it's not a human being, what the heck is it? <laughs> not a potato. It's not an alligator. <laughs> You know, teaching where I teach uh, at Princeton University, I live in a very, very liberal community, and you know, most most people here, of course, uh, believe in uh, abortion. But uh, when I go to someone's house, let's say, you know, invited over for dinner, uh, one of my liberal colleagues or whatever, uh, what do I often see? Sometimes on the refrigerator, uh, an image of a sonogra a sonographic image of a baby mm -hmm. in the womb. And it might be a new grandchild, right. and I and I'll and I'll you know go over and I'll and I'll smile and I'll point at the at the uh, at the picture, and I'll say, now who is this? And they'll say, oh, that's little Caitlin. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, who is the who is is Caitlin uh, a grandchild? Oh yes, absolutely. Our daughter Amy's uh, new baby. Uh, she's due next month. I said, oh, that's great. That's so wonderful that you got a baby on the way and baby's already got a name and we already know the sex of the baby and, uh, and, and so forth. But look at the cognitive dissonance there, right? Absolutely. When we want the baby, oh, we recognize it fully, of course, as a human being. But when the baby's inconvenient, when the baby's a problem, when the baby's trouble, then all of a sudden it's fetus. Then all of a sudden it's clump of cells. Come on, let's be straight. Let's be honest let's be consistent yeah yeah i don't i don't even personally use the term fetus anymore i talk about babies yeah someone uh someone mentioned to me the other day that when um people insist on using these latinate terms like if someone says fetus then okay then we're not going to say mother we're going to say gravita uh, <laughs> So look, let's talk. We can either we can do we can talk in Latin, we can talk in English, but it's going to mean the same thing. It comes down to the same thing. After all, Ben, what what does fetus mean? It means young one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so whether we're talking about the 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 fetus uh, a fetal elephant or we're talking about 
a, a fetal raccoon or we're talking about a fetal human being. We're just talking about a young member of the species, a very young member of the species. Absolutely. It's a developmental stage. That's mm -hmm. all it is. It's not some separate thing. There's not like a human being, a fetus, a crab, a raccoon. <laughs> There's a human being, which may be in the fetal stage, maybe in the adolescent stage, maybe in the infant stage, but a human being. Yeah, well, I, 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 I call them babies because I want people to start thinking of them as human beings yeah. and, and not as something else. And I, you and I have no problem with that, but there, there are those out there who want to dehumanize it. But you notice when they want the baby, it's a human being. It's a baby. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much. I know I'm dealing with a couple of pros here. When you dispense with all the questions through the course of your conversation, um, I appreciate both of you being on. We've talked a lot about um, the scientific, the cultural, and the legal perspectives of, of the pro-life. And I want to just thank our audience for listening in. Um, and also thank uh, our donor donors at American Cornerstone Institute who make this program and all our programs possible. A recording of this conversation will be available on our website at AmericanCornerstone.org. And I just wanna say thank you both for joining us on this important topic. Um, we, we really appreciate all the work that you all are doing uh, to, to help the unborn. Thank, thank you, Evelyn. Great to be with you, Ben. Great to be with you, Abby. Keep up the great work. We're so you proud too. of you. I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you.